All right, so we're moving on to trauma. Let's start with the adult. Trauma is the most common cause of death in 20 to 40 year olds, and the basics of trauma is always airway, breathing, and circulation. If a patient falls down three flights of steps and he has an obvious leg bone protruding out from the skin, the next best step is always to assess the airway, breathing, and then circulation. There is a nice chart I created here for the classifications of hemorrhagic shock, class one through four. One, you'll have less than 15% blood loss, no significant changes. Class two is 15 to 30. That's when you start seeing the uh, compensatory mechani mechanisms kick in and the, the patient will have tachycardia. Class three shock is 30 to 40% blood loss and that's when the patient is hypotensive and class four is greater than 40% blood loss. And this little pearl here that I placed is class three shock, the blood pressure drop. For pediatric trauma, you follow the same principles you do for adult trauma. So you assess the airway, the breathing, and the circulation. The most common cause of death in children greater than the age of one is trauma, and head trauma is the most common cause of traumatic death in a, ch in a child. So during your primary assessment of airway, breathing, and circulation, you need to recognize that children have disproportionately large occiput, contributed contributing to passive flexion of the spine. So you want to place this padding below the lower torso to neutralize the spine. You want to take caution with intubation as the tracheas are also shorter in children, so you may end up at, like actually intubating the right main stem bronchus. You want to go for laryngoscopy. If you're unsuccessful, children less than an eight, you can attempt needle cricothyroidotomy instead of surgical, and that's per the PALS uh, cutoff right now if you want to read the PALS uh, updates. If you are unable to garner peripheral IV access and the care is becoming delayed in the emergency room and this child needs your help, you can get intraosseous access or IO access. All your medications that can go through a central line can also go through IO lines without dose changes. So that's, that's a nice thing to note. The Cernum allows the quickish infusion rate of medications, but it requires specialized equipment and you may not have that in a rural area. So you want to uh, most commonly, you'll go for the proximal humerus. Uh, it's the most common site for intraosseous access in pediatric patients. And then the spinal cord injury without radiographic ab abnormality. This could be uh, suspected in anyone with blunt cervical trauma and neurological deficits, is, and it's more common in pediatric population. Uh, cir circumoral burn is basically when a child is chewing on electrical cords and you want to think in the back of your mind that a delayed complication would be a labial artery hemorrhage two to three days um, as the scab is premature and it will dislodge. And lastly, if you have any um, patients come in and the history is not matching up and you suspect uh, child abuse in the pediatric population, you want to work that up as well. For pregnancy trauma, the most important factor in preventing fetal demise is actually stabilizing the mother. When you place chest tubes the, in the pregnant patient, you need to go one or two levels higher compared to the non-pregnant patient. And then the best test to perform for abdominal trauma, first trimester's ultrasound followed by DPL, and then lastly, CT scan. Second and third trimester, you use ultrasound and CT scan. In the event that there is a maternal fetal hemorrhage or you have a high suspicion, you can use the Kleinhauer Beck test. The adult, the adult cells are going to stay clear, colorless. The fetal cells are going to be bright and pink. It has a very low sensitivity. So the most sensitive test for detecting placental abrupt abruption after trauma is actually continuous fetal monitoring. And then for uterine rupture, you're going to have signs and symptoms are consistent with the loss of uterine contour or palpable fetal parts. It's very common with uh, mothers that are in traumas that have previously had C-sections. Now, in the event that the patient goes into cardiac arrest, greater than four minutes of resuscitation has passed and the patient still remains in cardiac arrest, you need to take them back to the OR and perform an immediate C-section. Moving over to head trauma, the next best step is to order non-contrast head CT and rule out concomitant cervical spine. This is very high yield. 
In determining whether or not someone has a skull fracture or basal fracture, the linear type of skull fracture is often non-depressed fractures. They do not require treatment. Open require neurosurgery consultation and antibiotic treatment. Basal fractures, the signs and symptoms include cerebral spi spinal fluid leaking out of the eyes and nose, which is autorhinorrhea, and you may see mastoid ecchymosis, also known as battle sign, purplish rings around the eyes, which is raccoon eyes. Those are both very high yield. Most cerebral spinal fluid leaks resolve within one week, and then the initial imaging, which is often skull x-ray or CT, is usually negative, and you may need something more high resolution, like a high resolution CT to diagnose. The next best step in a patient with a head injury, altered mental status, and a non-contrast CT head positive for a bleed is you want to go ahead and do your airway, breathing, circulation, and prevent increased intracranial pressure. So after you've protected the airway and avoided hypotension, um, because the patient's having a brain bleed, the patient is going to have increased intracranial pressure, so you want to do things like elevate the head of the bed at 30 degrees, add mannitol and or hypertonic saline. Um, there's mixed literature supporting hyperventilation, so if you go for hyperventilation, target PCO2 of 30 to 35. If the patient has a seizure, you want to treat aggressively with antiepileptics. However, there is no prophylactic antiepileptic indications. Cushing's reflux is a very high yield, and it's a sign of impending herniation. So you'll look for things like a decreased heart rate, decreased respirations, and hypertension. If you see a uh, herniation question, you'll most likely see uncle herniation. That's also known as transcentorial herniation. It's where the temporal lobe or the uncus is compressed and moves toward the brainstem. It puts pressure on cranial nerve 3, leading to ipsilateral fixed dilated pupil and contralateral hemiplegia. So this entire slide is very high yield. The last little two bits I'd like to discuss for head trauma that are important for this exam is diffuse axonal injury. It can be seen following severe head trauma, mostly in comatose patients. The, basically, the duration of coma correlates to the severity. You diagnose it uh, with CT head, and you'll see multiple lesions on gray-white matter junctions. Concussions are transient alterations in mental status after head trauma. They lack uh, focal neurological findings. And the most common abnormality on CT in an elderly patient with head trauma is a cerebral contusion. Remember, anterior cord syndrome is a flexion injury or an anterior spinal artery occlusion, so they will have deficits in uh, motor and loss in pain and temperature. So they'll have paralysis and loss of pain and temperature, but they will have preservation of position, light touch, and vibration. Central cord syndrome is a hyperextension injury, and they're going to have weakness in the arms greater than the legs. brown saquard syndrome is a hemisection of the spinal cord, ipsilateral motor and positional loss with contralateral loss of pain and temperature starting one to two levels below the level of injury. The last section of the neck trauma, I want to discern the difference between spinal shock and neurogenic shock. Spinal shock occurs after spinal cord injury. It's usually a complete transection. The reflexes below the level of injury are decreased or lost, and there may be flaccid paralysis that can occur at all levels below the injury. There is no circulatory collapse, and the treatment is supportive and potentially surgical depending on the presence of vertebral fractures. This is different than neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock is caused by central nervous system trauma, whether or not that be in the brain or in the spinal cord above the level of T6, causing a loss of sympathetic stimulation to blood vessels. This leads to vasodilation, hypotension, and bradycardia from unopposed vagal activity. This can lead to organ failure and death if not treated promptly. So treatment is vasopressors and sometimes you add atropine in the event that they have bradycardia. The most commonly injured organ in penetrating trauma to the chest is the heart and it's specifically the right ventricle and life in the right ventricle, excuse me, in the right atrium. So Anytime someone has blunt trauma and hypotension, there are three main areas that can cause profound hypertension secondary to blood loss. Those are pelvic fractures, intra-abdominal injury, and intra-thoracic injury. So if you see someone basically who has a, a head injury and hypotension, you want to look somewhere else for their cause of hypotension. In other words, it's not due to their head bleed, okay? So when we talk about chest trauma, I want to talk about there's 
the indications for ER thoracotomy is whether or not there's a penetrating trauma or a blunt trauma. Penetrating trauma is when there's traumatic arrest with previously witnessed cardiac activity or if they have unresponsive hypotension. And then blunt trauma uh, indications for your ER thoracotomy are greater than 1,500 milliliters blood loss from the chest tube or or unresponsive to hypotension. Flail chest is when three or more adjacent ribs are fractured in two places and it's associated with morbidity from pulmonary contusion. Most patients are going to need some sort of positive pressure ventilation and you may, in very distressed patients, you may need to uh, intubate pretty quickly. In terms of pulmonary contusion, this this develops within the first 24 hours and resolves with one, within one week's time. It often doesn't show up on initial imaging and x-ray, but it's associated with rib fractures. You want to place the patient with the unaffected lung down, which is the dependent position, and the treatment is pain control, pulmonary toilet, and fluid restriction. If you have a high suspicion for an aortic rupture with chest trauma, you want to go ahead and get a chest x-ray and that will show widening of the mediastinum. The most common site of injury is the descending aorta, distal to the subclavian artery, and it has a very high mortality rate. A hemothorax, you need a minimum of 300 milliliters of blood to show up on the x-ray imaging, and so your treatment is a large bore chest tube. Indications for surgical thoracotomy is if the, the tube immediately drains greater than 1,500 milliliters of blood or greater than 200 milliliters per hour for two to four hours. Patients that present with pneumothorax have shortness of breath, chest pain, and you can best see this on an upright expiratory chest film. And if, there's, if it's large enough, you're going to go ahead and place a chest tube. Speaking of chest tubes, for pneumos, those are primarily placed on the anterior chest, and for hemothoraxes, those chest tubes are placed posteriorly. In tension pneumos, the patient will present with decreased breast sounds, distended neck veins, and tracheal deviation. It can lead to cardiac arrest, so the treatment is immediate needle thoracostomy followed by chest tube. Do not wait for imaging. This is very, very high yield. For tension pneumos, you need to do an immediate needle thoracostomy and then a chest tube. Do not wait for imaging. And last but not least, I'm going to talk about briefly about cardiac tamponade because it's very high yield for the shelf exams. That's, remember, Beck's triad. You have um, the jugular venous dissension, hypotension, and muffled heart sounds. You'll see pulseless paradoxus, which is a drop in the systolic blood pressure greater than 10 with inspiration. The EKG findings will be electrical alternans with the QRS alternating directions. And you diagnose cardiac tamponade with ultrasound, and the treatment is a fluid bolus and pericardiocentesis. And last but not least, we're going to talk about the abdomen and pelvic trauma. I'm just going to go ahead and rapid fire this as it's all high yield for a the upcoming shelf and board exams. So we're going to address liver, spleen, pancreas, bladder, and urethral injuries. Kerr's sign is referred pain to the left shoulder from splenic rupture. Seat belt sign is ecchymosis over the abdominal wall in a distribution of the seat belt, and it should raise suspicion for an intra-abdominal injury. For abdominal and pelvic trauma patients who are stable, the best diagnostic test is CT. The best diagnostic test for the hemodynamically unstable patient is ultrasound with a fast examination. The most common injured organ in gunshot wounds is the small bowel, then the colon, then the liver. The most commonly injured organs in stab wounds is the liver, the small bowel, and then the diaphragm. Pancreatic injury occurs with rapid deceleration injuries as the pancreas is often displaced against the vertebral column. In patients with pelvic trauma or shock, you do not palpate for pelvic fracture. Place a pelvic binder with high suspicion. The pelvic binder should be placed at the level of the greater trochanters of the femur. The three signs of urethral injury are, and this is very high yield, a high riding prostate, perineal bruising, and blood at the urethral meatus. Do not place a Foley catheter until retrograde urethrogram has been done to evaluate for urethral injury. Bladder rupture occurs most commonly at the bladder dome. Gross hematuria is almost 100% sensitive, so the absence of uh, hematuria uh, rules out a bladder rupture. Intraperitoneal requires surgical intervention. Posterior dome of the bladder 
uh, is ruptured so that the urine will enter the peritoneal cavity and cause peritonitis. Extra peritoneal is more common and associated with pelvic fractures and is correlated with, is corrected, excuse me, with placement of a Foley. And that concludes this high yield section on trauma.